Hey, hey, and welcome to the final session of the talks for WA Games Week. And we're finishing on such an exciting one. We have Michaela from Sydney Studio Mod. She's amazing. She knew all about virtual production before any of you probably even knew what that meant, or any of us knew what that meant. Um, I'm not going to say much because I know it's all in her presentation. But before I throw over to her, I just want to say thank you all for uh, <laughs> putting up with me as MC. This is not what I normally do. <laughs> games, games, games. games. <laughs> all right, here is Michaela. Thanks, Caitlin. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michaela. Um, I'm going to start my clock. And um, I'm going to do a general introduction to this topic that I am so excited about, virtual production. And then I'm going to uh, show you a bit how a small indie studio in Sydney gets to play in this space. So a bit about me. I'm a hands-on artist and director. Uh, I work on both sides of physical and virtual cameras. And uh, I am really excited about seeing more and more game people entering this space. This was the best review I've ever received as a game actor from a game last, last year called Wayward Strand. Um, and my little studio in Sydney, when I say little, we are little, we're small, five, five people at the moment. Um, we do a lot of stuff with Unreal Engine, but we are basically a real-time and virtual production specialist, uh, which basically means we work in this area of virtual production, but we are in Australia. A lot of the work I do is in Excel and in conversations and talking about things. The, Today's introduction is going to talk about the reality of virtual production in 2023, globally and locally. Uh, so in a nutshell, what I do is I'm an interactive experience designer. Um, so I, game design falls into that, filmmaking comes into that because you're still thinking about who's in the audience. And I'm really excited about having one process, one pipeline that can work both with fictitious worlds or story universes, but also the production teams. And the name of our studio is probably obviously inspired by that wonderfully creative um, culture that emerged from the game industry modding. So in a nutshell, I'm always thinking about two audiences. Who's the end user of the titles, if they're interactive or immersive? We're always thinking about production teams. And that's why virtual production is so exciting, because essentially we're creating an interactive experience for people on set, on a stage, and perhaps on the end of, a, end of a call. And it's always about bridging that story world and the production data. And at the end of the day, if you can make things more reusable and recyclable, I think that's a great thing. So virtual production is so many things to so many people. But often, these are the, the key concepts that uh, people think about. So I'm going to step through some of this stuff quickly. And there's lots of ways of thinking about virtual production on the high end. This is pretty much like the Hollywood definition of what we're talking about. Um, I think of it more broadly, real-time tools and techniques for storytelling. And the one that people usually start with is this idea of you're actually capturing in camera, with a physical camera, you've got visual effects that have been created live in the picture. And uh, the gods of virtual production decree that you cannot have a talk on virtual production without mentioning The Mandalorian. So <laughs> I will play the obligatory clip, but I want you to look at how things are framed because you've probably heard that they had an enormous LED volume that people got very excited about for series one. But look at how the shots are framed. Look how close things up. Here's a man in a Beskar suit <laughs> who's a walking armory bounty hunting to just make do in the gig economy, his name is on the show. But we know who to start. His puppet hooves, adorable and green, turned out to be a tiny cash machine. Through the dustiest worlds he rides, kicking ass and slinging guns like a mystery cowboy type. Hate to say it's all been done. Yes, but also no. It's, it's been done in the sense that we've had rear projection uh, for years. This is a, a making of still from North by Northwest from 1956. Cary Grant's just hit the dust because the crop duster has flown overhead. Um, but things have evolved, and things are evolving every year. And it's a really exciting time to first engage with virtual production. Um, but there is a lot of FUD out there, fear, uncertainty, doubt, um, because there's People love, love a, a good lead, and you know, there's been a, 
VFX industry in particular have been suffering from what they call the anti-CG backlash. This was a Guardian article re recently talking about that Barbie was made, the movie Barbie was made in exactly the same way as in 1910s. I'll let you be the judge. There have been dolls. But the dolls were always and forever baby dolls. Until... I love her. So, in 1910, I'm sure they had inspiration and influence, and we, you know, th this talk is not really to div dig into the parallels. But what they definitely did not have in 1910 was an LED stage <coughs> run by our friends at Lux Machina, who are an amazing small company in Hollywood that have worked on everything from The Mandalorian and all the films that predate the hype around The Mandalorian uh, that really pioneered uh, virtual production in the last decade. And we have our set that the children can work on within children-friendly hours. At magic hour, the time of day that it all looks beautiful, that can be frozen in time. We don't have to take them out into the real desert. And last but not least, this recent moderately successful film that you may have heard of is running on standard, this set is running on Unreal Engine, which you can download for free. Right? So in cultural terms, things have evolved and you are the beneficiaries of that. So that's one, the anti-CGI back, back, anti backlash is something to be aware of. There's also the, do, do we have too many of these stages? Is there too much hype around this? Unfortunately, in Australia, we have a problem that's not the same as in the US. Arguably, there are too many LED volume stages in the US, especially during a, a writer's and an actor's strike. Um, but we don't have that problem in Sydney. I'll show you the one uh, available stage to rent in Sydney uh, shortly. Um, but certainly, there is a, a distinction needs to be made between these pioneer large productions and the reality on the ground for the rest of the world of what we're doing. This is, n this is a space that I'm very passionate about opening up and democratizing things, but it's not happening overnight. We do rely on these huge productions uh, like Rogue One where the going into hyperspace was rear projected. Uh, Gravity where instead of having cameras on tripods, they had industrial car robots uh, driving the cameras and the actors were kind of like on tripods inside LED cages. Um, the recent Batman film, which was a really good... I'll let them Having done this before on another show, I saw the power of this very early on, and it's a positive for the final viewer when something is shot in camera. By pushing the technology along on Batman, Warner Brothers is going to make it more accessible to the next DP that does the next show. And that's really the point. These giant productions are learning. Huge amounts of money is being spent on developing the craft around this, but for every production that is using off-the-shelf real-time engines, um, the beneficiaries uh, have a huge opportunity. And the craft is evolving. Uh, a recent uh, Lux Machina project was the Apple TV series Hijack, which hooked up a flight simulator uh, to the LED volume. And uh, they used LED walls all over the place. But including these, I think this is a really good example of, LED, of the use of virtual production in camera visual effects because what, th what is on the LED wall in the show is actually other monitors. So they're actually, it's, it's got a, there's a real strong plot base for using large screens. Uh, not every show is going to be able to jump in and take immediate advantage of some of these techniques. But Lux were very canny, I think, about how they used um, um, LED uh, walls on this show. Simulcam is another area of virtual production that it has huge beneficiaries and the idea of onset visualization doesn't has a much uh, lower f cost footprint and this is a very old technique um, and in digital terms uh, we saw it on AI artificial intelligence for the first time <coughs> and I challenge you to find um, making of information on AI or artificial intelligence in 2023 uh, SEO has been completely 
We had targets around, primarily on the ceiling, that were barcoded, and we had probably about 800 of them. Each one had its own separate identity, and they were being looked at by a camera. And then the software and the computer could identify which barcode fit with which place. So as you pan the camera around, it knew in the computer world where the computer camera was looking around. And they matched up perfectly. And then we could, we could generate in the computer what the buildings looked like and then do essentially a video composite of the blue screen with this. So that technique is now something you can get off the shelf. You don't have to build your own individual markers. You can, you can go to vendors and hire systems like that. So fast forward from 2000, 2001, and fast forward to last year and Avatar Way of, work, way of Water, we've got um, new techniques coming in for refining the process of Simulcam with improving not just capturing the depth, so that color heat map like view is showing, we're actually capturing the, the depth within the scene of where the CG character is. And the, look where the head of the CG character is you're actually looking at a tiny monitor that is being driven around the set so that the eye lines can be correct. And this technique uh, is really going to be transformative over the years. Uh, and you may not have the budget or the wherewithal um, of James Cameron at the moment, but every storyteller should be thinking about eye line and the ability to um, visualize that eye line on set. The barriers are, are dropping. And so these techniques are kind of uh, evolving and they're blending. And so the overall area, one of the areas that I'm particularly focused on is performance capture. Virtual production has huge opportunities around uh, performance capture. This is a recent test from Framestore. It was a short film. And just to show you how little of, how they blend real and physical, uh, real and virtual, sorry. What you were seeing in that, in that short film, there was hardly anything of the, the, the live action plate being used. So in this breakdown, you can see top left, the previs, top right. This is what the, cam the, the physical camera is seeing. And live on set, they're compositing. They're joining together elements of the previs and the CG with the live action. And then you can see, finally, the live action. So the only bit of the plate that's actually that the audience will ever see is that face. And again, these techniques are still evolving, um, but these large companies are testing the groundwater so that people can mix and match the techniques in different ways. So putting them all together, it isn't drag and drop at the moment. You have to stop, step back from the tech, and you have to think about what are you trying to achieve? what you were trying to achieve in terms of story, but also what you're trying to achieve as a team. Who's in your team? Who's in your crew? What resources do you have available? It's not just about throwing computers in a room. You need to map out how all of this information is moving, and everything needs to be supported. And there can be huge pressure put on uh, various parts of these systems if they've never been tested before. And so part of the reason we're seeing case studies emerge mainly from the larger productions, is because they've got the resources to do the R&D up front. But the good news is that these experiments and, uh, and virtual production is spreading like wildfire. So at a recent um, gathering in, in Los Angeles that I was part of, looking at kind of the state of virtual production, um, Australia wasn't even on the map and was listed in the, in the names down the bottom, but all those hot spots in red, there's just so many ac uh, areas of um, activity. And for a small studio like us, uh, it's really important to know where to focus on. One of the early decisions uh, we made was not to invest in any LED wall hardware. We decided not to try and reinvent ourselves as a facility. Uh, we focused on software. And that was partly the origins of the company and my background as a filmmaker with a computer science degree. But it was also about going, this stuff isn't going anywhere. We don't have to solve all the problems in virtual production in the next five years and 10 years. Um, this is an evolving space. And it's a paradigm shift that is very apparent when you've got a project released. But when you're in the middle of it, an LED volume is 
will, will feel like a large TV when it's working. It's, it's, a lot of the effort is still behind the scenes. Um, I, there's two key quotes that have inf influenced my approach to filmmaking and linear storytelling. One is that filmmaking is a branch of computer science. That was from Ted Nelson, who coined the term hypertext in the 60s. And just the realization as I started with short films that films are like icebergs. And it's the same with game dev. You know, what the audience sees is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much going on under the surface. So there's plenty of time. No one has missed the boat in virtual production. Uh, but, and at the same time, those who've been in it for a while are just constantly refactoring and, and reiterating. So our journey really was about building our capacities as a software development team, regardless of the, the filmmaking and game interactive experience aspirations, so we could move from virtual production plugins through to applications, through to software as a service. And some of these dot points I've got on the screen at the moment are reflective of the case studies I'm going to show you now, which are very diverse. And there's, there's a real joy in being able to present lots of a variety of, of diverse work. But as a business owner, that's also really challenging because sometimes there's nothing better than having a series of projects that are pretty much the same thing. You can have the same skill set and you can roll it out, one, 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 one. So there are certainly challenges in doing lots of diverse um, uh, types of work. And that's the reality we've found of being an indie in this space we get approached sometimes for the impossible project or the project that doesn't quite neatly fit any existing higher profile vendor and then we get the opportunity to explore. So to give you an example, we've been working with NIDA, the National Drama uh, Academy, for the last two years. And that's been really exciting because um, education is obviously key to this space and having the opportunity to uh, write a strategy and start the rollout of how do we infuse virtual production culture into um, a building where some of the finest actors of the next generation are was a huge opportunity. And in the process of doing the rollout, la two years ago, we produced one of our most virtual worldy uh, plugins to date, which is to say we came up with a plugin that allowed you to design your avatar, your, your character online on the web, and just copy and paste your avatar link into Unreal and do that twice. And if there happen to be two actors sitting and standing nearby in motion capture suits, basically five seconds later, you can start acting. And this works surprisingly well because it was all about getting first year actors and a st st staff who knew nothing about Unreal getting into the mix and acting uh, as quickly as possible. So treating Unreal Engine, if you like, like a dumb terminal. All you need to do is copy and paste a URL from the web. And we did that knowing that the look of those avatars, Ready Player Me is, is the name of the startup, well, not really a startup anymore, but uh, they're the, the web company that makes it. They um, have a particular cartoony aesthetic and you can get other aesthetics out there. And so what we did was build into the roadmap the idea that we could do more photorealistic characters over time. Because in parallel, we were building our, our relationship with Epic Games. We worked on a project in 2017 which kind of became the genesis of the MetaHuman system you may have heard of now, which Epic's put a huge amount of resource into developing uh, a very affordable way of um, Unreal Engine devs and dev teams to create characters. And so fast forward to this year, at NIDA we started uh, rolling out MetaHumans. And that was very satisfying because then we started using the MetaHumans uh, so this is a real character, Sandman, from the 90s TV. And this is his younger self avatar. And this is a grab from a live uh, experimental show where he's being interrupted by his younger self. And we, we set it up like a ventriloquist puppet so that basically he was basically controlling his own avatar. And this was perfect. We didn't have to worry too much about the limitations of real-time production because at the end of the day, the show was being evolved with a test audience. Um, at the other end of the scale, uh, we started, we've started working with animated film companies. And probably the biggest uh, challenging project we've had to date was working with Animal Logic, another Sydney company recently sold to Net Netflix, who wanted to connect their 
um, Academy Award winning animation pipeline, animated film pipeline, to Unreal for the first time. And so what we did was provide the bridge between their amazing team of digital artists who produce um, renders and bring them to life live in various ways. So here's an example of, this is what the, the final result that was largely not completely rendered in Unreal using um, the fledgling uh, USD support uh, that comes with un Unreal. USD is a, an emerging standard for um, managing your uh, digital uh, film assets. And this is the kind of stuff we were doing behind the scenes. So here's director David, and he's kind of doing Muppet Show style puppeteering of his ferret and robot characters. And the brief was to do something that was a bit like the Muppet Show. So we're, we're, we're creating uh, interfaces to hand mocap. Now, if you haven't done hand mocap before, Caitlin can probably tell you this because she's a, a pro at mocap, that hand mocap is the jankiest of it all. All right, so this was a really, really um, uh, highly calibrated experience for the director to bring his characters to life live. I said I'd show you Australia's, uh, Sydney's only LED, rentable LED stage at the moment. So this is at TDC in Alexandria. And our friends at Spectre Studios um, invited me to uh, supervise a job, uh, I think it was two years ago, uh, where it was basically a shiny floor show. So, you know, the kind of look of your, your game shows. And um, this was during the, the crypto mania era. So it was, there was a kind of a gambling uh, dimension to it. Um, but what was interesting for me as a supervisor is that I wasn't just supervising what was happening on this LED volume. I was also supervising where it was being streamed out. It was being streamed out to terrestrial uh, like broadcast television, but it was also being streamed into a virtual world called Decentraland. So there was all kinds of uh, interactive experience uh, dimensions to the uh, um, event as well. I said this was going to be diverse. Completely different uh, change of pace, but also very much virtual production. Um, we have started in exactly the same way as the Avatar project I showed you um, was doing volumetric capture, so capturing the depth of a scene with multiple cameras as part of their standard filming process. A few years ago, we worked with the producers of, or well, the VFX uh, team of 2067, which, which was shot in South Australia. And holograms were a key plot point. And the, just before they went uh, into um, to shoot, they were like, doesn't Michaela's studio do this stuff for real? So we got the call. I brought some uh, connect, old Connect cameras down, and alongside the ARRI camera unit, where uh, they had, if you like, the A camera, the, the cinematic uh, shots were all being captured, I would move my little array of Connect cameras, depth cameras, around the set every time the actors were performing something that was going to appear as a hologram in the movie. So it was very satisfying when the film came out, and even in the trailer, to see some of the framings that I'd done with my preview monitor were what the VFX team just ran with. Because at the end of the day, they had the director was able to see this stuff happening live on set. It wasn't potentially, a, the aesthetic was a lot simpler, but you get the idea. This is a, a technique. And so I think we're going to see, and this was a couple of years ago, volumetric video is uh, something that like even the latest iPhone cameras are, are come with the ability to shoot video from two cameras. So think about how you can capture depth as part of your storytelling. And you may be that you're actually making videos that are purely references, say as part of a game production. But always think about if you can capture the 3D essence of your live performances, that data could be useful. And sometimes there's a lot of pressure on. Sometimes the pressure is economic, and sometimes it's just different. This project was our highest pressure volumetric capture gig because in the middle of COVID, we got the call to shoot um, Holocaust survivors over two months of filming with 26 cameras rolling, um, capturing their testimony during the Holocaust for the Sydney Jewish Museum. And this is a gig we would never have received uh, if it wasn't for COVID because a team from the US would have arrived and set up all the equip their equipment and have done it. But because of COVID, we get the call, the gear arrives in the post, and then we operate it. And I have the uh, 
uh, uh, responsibility of signing off and saying uh, 326 terabytes of Holocaust survivor testimony has been backed up and can go to the U US postal system. So that was our big data wrangling um, case study. And some of the survivors have since passed. So, you know, incredible opportunities to capture the essence of things. So moving swiftly along, um, we have a project that is going to be released at South by Southwest Sydney uh, shortly, which was um, the opposite of two months of volumetric video. What can we do in a single day with a First Nations traditional owner to create volumetric video and a game quality avatar so that this particular tribal governance council can get hands-on experience and make deci informed decisions about how to capture their cultural heritage because they wanted to explore holograms. And so we're really excited about being able to give uh, a First Nations community um, assets that, that correspond uh, to this project. So this, if, uh, hopefully there'll be a bit, of, bit about that shortly. Um, another thing I'm super excited about is the ability to do all these amazing virtual production experiments, not just with computers in the room, but in the cloud. This is a project we did for, um, is my video playing? I don't think it is. There we go. Uh, this is a project we did for Yahoo Labs where every user um, at a virtual concert experience essentially is allocated an Unreal Engine instance in the cloud. And so we created games, there was a live motion captured performance happening, but ultimately this was a proof of concept to show that we could be mixing NPCs with actual concert goers, provide interactive entertainment, and at its core, provide something that is kind of equivalent to what the gorillas shows, so the, the old style um, virtual pop stars. This is by far my favorite uh, virtual production today. This is in the middle of COVID. I got to direct Harry Shearer. You might know him from The Simpsons. I always think of him as the bass player in Spinal Tap. Um, at home, in LA, performing his music video clips as Donald Trump. This is my setup in Sydney. So it's all been directed over a laptop and where I'm, con I'm basically managed, managing a virtual production in LA and the rule was we could only have one crew in the room. So everything else was being done remotely in, from Sydney. So I'm gonna speed through a lot of this stuff, but I am to leave you with a, a new idea. One of the things I'm super passionate about is this idea that in-camera visual effects don't have to be passive. It doesn't just have to be the Mandalorian standing in front of, uh, with his reflective helmet um, with the background. The Mandalorian potentially could be doing some, triggering something, or the actors could actually be interacting with the set. Imagine if the next Australian election, um, the, the commentators looking at all the stats are actually in a virtual world. So we set out to test these ideas a few years ago, and I had a very simple idea of like a planetarium approach, um, which turned into this idea of, what if we could like do a follow the money minority report style investigation, where all the data you were accessing was from government databases. Stuff that's quite dry, but could we make it more interesting and more engaging through um, making a broadcast quality virtual set? And this is the aesthetic that we came up with. And this turned into a Steam release called uh, A Clever Label. And it was basically a deep dive into who funds the anti-hate groups um, like the Australian Christian Lobby and looked at how various individuals and organizations um, are related. So it was a giant graph. And this was a, a really tricky project to fund under the Morrison regime, but we, 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 yeah. we did it, um, mainly with the help of you know, serv good services work so we could reinvest in it. But we, you know, shout out to Microsoft, Epic Games, and Neo4j, the graph database vendor, who put resources into it for us. This project allowed us to then spin off this engine, and this was the first uh, customer who approached us to use the same technique for their own data. They said, we loved what you did with 200 nodes of information. What if we give you the Australian internet topology, 4.3 million records? Because APNIC is the organization that manages the Asia Pacific section of the internet. And so we've built a, a forensics tool and that's being piloted at the moment. What you're looking at is a, a video, there's no post-production. This is, this is basically a view using, that's what we're currently seeing is a VR view. 
That's using the Live plugin that you can get for Unreal Engine and Unity. So if you've ever seen Beat Saber mi mixed reality videos, exactly the same tech. And this is our prototype that runs on the Quest Pro. It's a color pass through. So you know, in a good position to try that um, you know, super expensive Apple tech when it comes out. So I hope that gives you a, a flavor of what we're doing. Um, I'm really excited about starting really simple. That whole Grapho project started with this very simple idea of could we come up with a spatial interface that allows someone on a LED volume or a, just a rear projection to interact with the experience. Um, I eat my own dog food. I do keynotes with it. Um, sorry I didn't do it today. Um, but uh, if you come to Sydney, you'll, you'll see us doing these sort of demos. Um, and like I said, this stuff is not new in some respects. In 2013, we launched a show uh, that you know, prior to the current generation of virtual production, that audiences could pretend it was a concert, but it was interactive. Uh, there, there's lots of stuff, uh, opportunities. So in terms of futures, um, I'm going to jump to questions uh, very quickly. But I think um, we're going to see more and more of this stuff going live. Um, I'm really excited about uh, theatrical um, experiences, like VR theatre. I'm also really excited to see uh, Australian productions that are starting to play with these tools on the indie level. We've been working with Sally Coleman, who um, has got a virtual, she's an ex Triple J uh, DJ. And uh, if you're in Sydney on the 28th, she's going to be doing her premiere uh, virtual band performance uh, that we had a very small, small hand in, but I'm very excited. And just a tiny piece of tech um, the latest version of Unreal supports a brand spanking new uh, technology framework called Simpty. Uh, 22110, I still don't know how you pronounce it, um, but it means that a lot of the, gr the drudgery of building those giant sets is going to be simplified. Um, and so in a way, those, those giant projects that I showed at the start have paved the way to a lot simpler entry points. Um, and if you're interested in this area, plenty of resources. I'm not going to spend any time on it now, but whether you're creative, thinking about virtual art department, just interested in managing the data or working on set. There's just there's a lot of ways of uh, engaging with this world. I'm going to skip over that at the moment. Um, but I can only speak for our recent experience with Unreal. We haven't been using Unity so much lately. But every uh, few turtles in the room, nothing to do with that. Um, <laughs> but um, there, ev with every release of Unreal, there's, there's new tools. Uh, a few years ago, you basically had to roll your own um, remote controls, and now you can just download one. Um, and everything is just about lowering that barrier to entry. Um, resources, lots of them out there. Um, so thanks very much. I'm going to uh, jump straight to the end. And um, if you've got any questions, um, this is a, just an idea of the village. We don't do everything by ourselves. These are some of the other companies we work with uh, locally and around Australia. Um, thanks for Anyone in the? Oh, I can see it. I can see you. <laughs> oh, I'll come break the ice. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to talk. Okay, okay, okay. But I, I could do a question okay. from the Sorry. ops desk. I'll do a question from the ops desk. Um, when can I start with you? <laughs> <laughs> that touch. was so incredibly inspiring. Thank you. And Thank I've been you. a person at the front taking notes and asking all the questions. Quick intro, so my name is Michelle and I am here to support the creative technologies industries as funded by Jetsy. Um, and I'm so blown away and here's a real life example. My background is in project management, big um, events, business support, startups, getting lots of money for people and they're the, they're the tools I've been employed to bring to the creative tech industries in Western Australia. I ran a major event uh, a couple of months ago um, involving 700 youth promoting tech pathways. I reached out to all my connections at Microsoft, at Curtin, at the multiple universities because I said, I want a hologram of Lynn Beasley. Um, I had a massive budget because I had a lot of um, mining companies and whatnot putting money in. And everyone came back and told me that it couldn't be done. And because you know who I didn't reach out to? I didn't reach out to gaming. And one thing that's come across very strongly to me this week is that you guys are so underrepresented in technology I, and so I'm really going to make this a big um, part of my job because if I'd have reached out to you 
with my budget, I might have got a hologram of Lynn Beasley. Um, so, yeah, I, yeah, so that's really cool. So I just want to say thank you to all of you for welcoming me mm. into your beautiful community. And also, that was, I, I will talk to you more. <laughs> that mm. was great. But thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks no worries. I'll take it as a comment, but yeah. a quick comment oh, on no, that. Sorry. No, no, it's great. <laughs> um, just, to, just a point on the holograms. We started that project with a, a, a holographic display from a company called Looking Glass that was 500 bucks. So, you know, very modest. Um, and they make much more expensive ones. But part of the, the key, I think, to working as an indie is finding an appropriate entry point to go from the blank sheet of paper to something. Because sometimes, yeah, it's, you know, it's, you've, you've, it, it, that's, that can be the hardest thing. Um, but thank you very much for that. Um, I wanted to say special kudos for call it, calling it the Morris regime. It was like, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm not eligible to vote yet. But uh, that, uh, aside of that, I was curious, this, this investigation project in who funds hate groups, is that still available or is the, mm. the project and how can I access it? Yeah, absolutely. So you can go to Steam and type in a clever label and uh, it's, it's, a, it's basically a virtual reality title. Um, I was actually a bit nervous because we'd never tried to put a documentary experience on Steam before and I wasn't sure if it would just be rejected because it wasn't like a game. Um, but they actually do have a category of interactive documentary and so yeah, that's available. And the project, the, yeah, the project has officially ended but it's been engineered so that if we got takedown notices or whatever, uh, we've had quite a lot of effort for the data to still be available. So yes, definitely there. Thank you for this. this. This was so interesting to me. Um, Thank you. I think from my perspective, I'm particularly curious about the comment you made around um, things not happening if not for COVID, um, and and particularly you know the intersection of big Hollywood. You kind of mentioned a few times that the the reason you know those big fish, so to speak, are really important and valuable from an R and D perspective. But I'm also really curious um, if you were to see the industry grow more, would you see um, you know, those things being able to be done in Australia without flying an American cruise? Like, mm. Is that something that you see as a problem that needs to be solved, or do you think that it's the benefit here outweighs any of the negatives? Well, that's a great question. So I'm not an expert in making money or growing economies. <laughs> and I'm, interest I'm, I'm interested in this area artistically, as well as technologically, and I'm enough of an entrepreneur that I've been self-employed most of my career. But the size of my company gives you an idea of how difficult it is to operate even as a, as a micro-indie. So it's a great question because logically, I think every state should have at least one LED, should be able to support one LED volume business that can support the independent sector as well as major productions. But th this, is real, this is a real estate question. And we saw what happened in Melbourne recently was that the world's largest LED volume, which got huge amounts of state government support, got poured in, and the production it was brought, it was assembled to do, fell over. Now the indie virtual production sector in Melbourne isn't currently taking, getting any advantage from that US company being parachuted in. Not to say they're not doing a good job and that it couldn't grow, but I think it's a very tricky dance. And we've seen it in Sydney with Fox Studios, which is now Disney. I expect to be able to call up when I, you know, I do very low volume business. I had to get a semi-trailer into Sydney recently to do a 4D scan of uh, that First Nations uh, uh, traditional owner as well as another five people. And we needed a, a semi-trailer from Melbourne with 120 cameras. And so I went straight to Disney Studios and said, you know, can we book some parking space on the lot? And w there was none available. And so a lot of the, the, the trick, the, the challenge, that was a scary couple of days till we found parking. <laughs> Thank you, NEP, um, uh, who are the parent company of Lux Machina. Um, the, so the challenge is always, you know, state governments are keen to get in the big productions. Sure, there's huge opportunities working and learning and being part, and they definitely grow the economy. But supporting the, the indie sector in parallel is a really tricky business. I just think if, if, if there were, every state could support organizations like us who were um, nimble. You have to be very nimble. You can't expect to get the same kind of work in the space week to week. And that's very challenging. 
I hope that helps. <laughs> mm. Mm. G'day, Michaela. Um, G'day. That was a that was amazing. Um, as an educator, so I work at SAE um, in animation. What would you recommend for stu uh, students who want to get into this space, especially in Australia, that they kind of skill up in? You know, obviously Unreal, but like. Uh, in in any particular area mm -hmm. where they would have the best advantage to actually get work in this um, obviously booming area right now? Another great question. So we're actually teaching, my team is actually producing a media installation for the foyer at, at uh, NIDA and as, and as part of that commission we're also, we, we've just developed and we're teaching a Unreal for Production Design unit of study. And what we did, we, put, we, we did use Unreal for that, but I sort of mumble because I'm not here to shill Unreal. There's lots of approaches to it, but I think the most important thing is to s have hands on each student getting experience with a real time engine and learning some fundamentals about some of those concepts that I talked about. And then the most important thing, next step, is collaborative workflows. What I've seen too many times around education institutions is that not enough attention is put into uh, version control systems and how files get moved. So for example, at NIDA, um, the default position is that everything goes through SharePoint. Don't try and do game development <laughs> or virtual production via Microsoft SharePoint. <laughs> you know? Microsoft being fantastic production partners, I don't think they'll mind me saying that's not how you do it. So <laughs> it's, it's um, I think, technical designers who work for ed educational facilities who their job is to translate between production and, and IT are invaluable. And it's a really hard environment to just come in as professionals sometimes because, uh, you know, uh, and we've had to have conversations recently, there's only so many levels of collaboration we can do without there being like a Perforce server that everyone's, and, and that being part of the curriculum. And not many schools teach version control because it doesn't sound particularly sexy, but yeah, so th it's those kinds of conversations. They're slow, not very exciting, but they lay the groundwork, I think. Perforce is a version control software that we use, by the way. <coughs> and Git is as Perforce. I was mentioning Perforce. That's a, a tool for managing, you know, who's made changes to what pieces of software. And there's there's other uh, products as well. Um, <coughs> Just out of curiosity, and it's not entirely serious, but kind of it is. Uh, if, if we take the haptics out of the equation and like temperature and everything else, uh, how many decades are we away from a holodeck experience like we've seen it on Star Trek? <laughs> because that's a discussion we have in the VR space very often. How far are we away from that? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I feel very honored to being, you know, my clubbing days were mainly in the 90s and <laughs> I got to experience smelly festivals when you didn't have phones and stuff like yeah. that. And I, we've done six virtual concert proof of concepts and it's all about, we, I don't like the M word, metaverse, I don't use metaverse, but virtual worlds is kind of one of the things we do. I just honestly can't see it. I can't see it, but only because I'm, I'm very much a literal technologist. I'm, I'm, and that's, I, I'm, I can compartmentalize my creative ideas from running a dev team. And honestly, I feel like we can already hallucinate. We don't need digital technology. And there are people hallucinating <laughs> as we speak yeah. and designing and getting huge sums of money to develop some of these ideas. But I think from a, from what, from a practical perspective, I don't think we're, we're close. And I think the focusing on that is causing some huge da dangers. So yeah, I'm 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 not a tech utopian by any means. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. It's a tricky one to introduce in a Q and A. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I'm I'm fascinated. I think yeah, science fiction is where I dive into a lot of that stuff. And you know, that I was reading Neuromancer while I was building one of the early web websites in Australia, you know, back in the days when, you know, they added your website to a list of what was on the internet. So I've kind of watched it grow from this kind of academic thing into, you know, before advertising, I was on the web before advertising. And I kind of feel like, at this, so that's my pragmatic hat on. The other hat on is I can't wait to be completely wrong.
I have, a, I have a question not as MC for a second. <laughs> um, I really liked, I liked how you mentioned before that, um, you know, there should be more support and infrastructure there that indie studios can use because we are more agile. We can jump around like one minute we're doing mocap, the next we're doing like LED walls because why not, we can. Um, what sort of support would you like to see for studios like yours and us when we get to that point um, that could actually give us that like lift up that we need to be more visible to people like Michelle, for example? Yeah, look, I think, well, certainly access to stages um, is, uh, you know, if there aren't, when, when stages exist purely to serve the large international productions, then it's very hard to um, have a diversity of voices in the space. So, I mean, my preference would be there was some way of accessing the larger stages, but in practicalities, as I alluded to before, I'm not entirely convinced it's that, you know, that workable. I mean, we literally, I was literally on the phone to the head of Fox Studios when the Thor um, uh, Love and Thunder was wrapping. I was like, oh, you know, you, you're talking, you're packing it down and sending the stage back to LA. Is there any way that, you know, some indies can get access to this, you know, before it goes? And it's, it's no one, it's in no large studio's interest to do that. I think what might happen is we have all of these like shopping centers and West, you know, that have these super expensive video walls at the moment for advertising. And, you know, Christmas time, you might see a VR pop up in, in the point. Well, they do in Sydney. Do they probably do it here as well? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I, well, I can imagine, I can imagine pop, pop up LED stages that were kind of, you know, parceled out to a bunch of indie projects. We, we batch stuff, like and I mentioned my semi-trailer arriving from Melbourne so we could do 40 scans. I did five, five productions worth of scans that day. Three of them were in-house projects, two of them were commercial jobs that were paying for it, but I didn't bring the semi-trailer until I had enough volume of work. So I quite like the idea of, you know, you could have a pop-up LED volume that was just for um, bands, for example or it doesn't even have to be an LED volume. It could be a green screen with simulcam set up that was basically maybe every day it was a different act. But some kind of, you know, I think you could fund it from a, um, a community perspective because, as I said, the costs are dropping, but it still all needs to be supported. And that's where we, we so the last bit of your question in terms of, I mean, this talk's not about what we want as, as a company, but what we're trying to do is tell people that just because Epic Games has a free product that you can download doesn't mean virtual production with it is necessarily a free thing or when something goes wrong people just expect to be able to pick up the phone or email epic games and get support it's like well no actually that's what the partners are for so we're trying to provide just boring technical support for people who are doing stuff um, but yeah there's there's more imaginative entrepreneurs than me who can think about the message that will light up the eyes of, um, you know, the funders. Yes, value for money. We just need to make it valuable for money. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, and then we'll get the best Well, not necessarily. <laughs> I mean, because back, back um, when we were doing, you know, the, the orchestra project I put up, I mean, that, that technology was actually first used at uh, the Interactive Cinema Centre in um, UNSW. And it's very few uh, commercial outputs of that ever happened, apart from mining. But at the same time, we don't see that kind of tech around Australia or internationally because, yes, it didn't, it sort of, it was maybe a couple of proof of concepts happening with mining, but then there was nothing after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think in, indies, indies do what indies do. And you know, the, main, the main message today really is to say that, you know, you don't have to stop, start thinking about this. You, you can work out indie ways of approaching this, but it's, um, knowing what not to do can be really valuable, I think. So Game Workers Australia, yep. join. Join the union. Go comrades, um, comrades. Union <coughs> strong. I am an employer, but <laughs> I say GWA. Um, a number of years ago, sort of 2017 <coughs> time, um, we had a VR game that we needed to do a trailer for, and we did some virtual production. And I realized that, like, 
one of the reasons we did it on our own was it was very hard to find anybody in Australia doing that. And we should have reached out to you because that would have been a lot easier for everyone involved, I suspect. Um, where can people go to like, like what is a good resource? What is a good connection? Like where, where if a studio here was doing some and they needed some sort of weird video stuff, how do we network, <laughs> right? Well, the way, because this is all built around real-time engines, I think the real-time engine social media presences are often a good place to start. I mean, we, we run, I run mod from Discord, and, you know, we sometimes get work from, you know, Unreal Engine discords or Touch Designer discords or Houdini discords. I mean, that's just one example. But I think, um, yeah, look, again, I'm not, we're not great at marketing. And we're also um, not trying to be all things to all people. And one of and and to put a serious side on it, one of the reasons that we're still in business is that we can't afford to do too much for free. So we charge like plumbers. You know, we, we actually time and materials, and and so that's not appropriate for. So sometimes the best approach is to do it yourself. But what we've found is, and like Sally's project, for example, we typically in the same way as we don't have a large IT department, we'll buy time from IT companies. We encourage people to buy not so much, we'll do everything for you, but just buy some time or you know, think of us. To, because I think when I did computer science, probably the most useful thing I learned in the four years of being at university was you're never gonna learn every, everything, but you can learn who the experts are. And whether it's the expert who's like the global expert or the expert in the room or in the company or in your street or suburb, that's really valuable. And so there are people who will come to us because they, word of mouth, we, we can do certain things, but we're not claiming we can do everything here. And the reason I put the village slide up as well is because we're constantly outsourcing as well and forming new, uh, you know, le loosely coupled groups of smaller businesses to be able to do large projects. And I guess that's where we're a little bit different is that we're, we like being small, but also being ambitious about, if we're gonna do a big project, we've got to bring in, lot, and that's, a, that's very hard to do, it takes a long time, and that's why we're low, low volume. So no project is too small to reach out, but you won't find us kind of, I don't know, actively saying we're the best at doing blah, blah, blah. That's a bit of a turn off. Yeah, that was a bit of a ramble too. <laughs> But I'll put the names of some of our colleagues up as well, so you can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a terrible thing to say, but one of the one of the quotes I was told years ago by a, a good friend here in Australia is like, the reward for doing something amazing in Australia is you get asked to do the next project for free. And this isn't a business talk, but at the end of the day, you do have to value your time, and. There's a lot of exploitation. Um, I was one of the founding members of the ADG when we became a union, and I'm, there's just so much op opportunities for exploitation around not just the creative side, but also the technical side of interactive entertainment, because the stuff is cool. You, know, you can always find young people who are excited about doing it, but if you, if you wanna have a long-term career in this space, you've really got to manage the resources in a way that's not just thinking about get rich quick. Because people come and go, we usually do well in the downturn because a lot of our competitors disappear. Um, we're sort of the opposite of fail fast. If we're failing, we're failing really slow. My career is a slow fail. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, wonderful presentation. Thank you so Thank much you. for that. Um, um, I work in the AR space and a question that came up the other night is when you get people approaching you who ask, what is a VR? Or what is an AR? Um, it's brown. And that's, <coughs> <laughs> and that's the client's way of asking you, supposedly, can they, you know, work with you. So how do you, given, you know, you're a small team with finite resources, how do you go about assessing potential clients and who, you know, obviously there's amazing projects that you've worked on, but, you know, what's your kind of checklist mm. or health metric or something when assessing those kinds of projects when they yeah, come Yeah, great question. Okay, so, I mean, if this is useful to anyone, copy it, um, look at our webpage on it, run with it. Um, we've done, we've had so many inquiries. I mean, Mod, the Australian company is 13 years old and previously uh, Mod Films was six years old. So we had so many similar inquiries over such a long period of time. 
uh, we just try to convert the wooliest ones or even the great ones, but basically get them to pay for a, you know, a workshop, pay for a day, you get a facilitated workshop and a write-up, and then if that's not enough, then move straight into scoping week one, scoping week two, and all of our best service work, most successful projects that were commissions have typically started with you know, a workshop or a week of R&D. Because we are kind of like an R&D company without a parent company. And so part of the reason we have to charge time and materials is because if you say, oh yeah, you want me to invent something and it's going to cost you 3,512 cents. <laughs> I mean, you're making it up, right? But you, you, so there has to be, we confront that head on. And you know, we've had some of my most satisfying, satisfying projects have been where you know, we just did a workshop or we, you know, they paid for a day, or they just did a week of scoping, and then the project soared, and we weren't involved with anything else except, you know, that little bit. We're not trying to own everything. Sometimes we'll, we'll handball to other people, but um, it's, it's one of the reasons we don't do that much work in advertising, because typically advertising, you have to have an idea that you sell to a client, and you need to be confident that the idea works before you can sell it to the client and get a budget. And so there's often the expectation that these folks like us, in mad scientists in their lab, can basically work out what that crazy idea would be ahead of there actually being a budget. And there's lots of, there's lots of folks who will jump into that and people make lots of money that, but from a, yeah, just our particular model is that we, 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 it's that upfront bit that we're actually rather sell just that and nothing else. I don't know if that's helpful. <coughs> so I didn't expect this to go into sort of businessy type things, but uh, any 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 gaps that I left out of the because, like I said, virtual production is this kind of large space. Are there any particular areas of virtual production that I didn't get to that you want to talk about? Uh, we're at time, but oh. I have one more question that I want to ask because I think it'd be interesting for other people that may not necessarily know to ask this question. Um, as we're a you know, growing industry in WA and there's a lot of students coming out of these um, games courses, they're not necessarily thinking about virtual production. How valuable do you think it is that these students in game development, game art and stuff are learning these real-time workflows for virtual production as well and the overlap? Yeah, great question. Um, we made up a job description call, a job role called virtual production generalist a few years because there was a student that uh, we thought had potential and she didn't have necessarily anything specific around virtual production but had backgrounds in various things. And the main thing we needed for that role was the ability to document. And I think I've seen a lot of amazing artists, technologists, creative people who can't document their work. Virtual production, hopefully I've demonstrated today, you know, is a great way of, you know, make a video of your thing. <laughs> so maybe not even thinking of it as virtual production, but starting with this is something in your palette of tools that can help you document who you are, what you've done, and why people should take pay attention to it. And then, yes, if it's video related, your path will cross with virtual production at some stage down the line. Amazing. Thank you so much Aww. for coming over for it. <laughs> <laughs> so Thank you. Um, that's actually our last talk session. Oh, <laughs> I, that, that went so fast. The last six months felt like so long, and then the last four days went so quick. Um, thanks to everyone who came. Thanks to everyone who jumped on and watched the streams. Um, everyone that made this possible. Um, games, games, games. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have a VR? Oh, that was great. Thank you for bringing that up one more time. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that is wrapping our first talk series ever. We hope you loved it. And don't forget, we got Immerse Connect tomorrow and Perth Games Festival on Saturday. Yeah. Well done. Wait, 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 wait. We, got, we, have, we have one last set of thanks to give. So I'm sorry to, to steal the camera. For those who don't know me, I'm Alan. I'm also part of the steering committee. If I can also harass Nat into getting on stage, you're not getting out of this one. Natalie Marino. So 
Um, I just wanted to step in to say that, um, first off, none of this would be here if not for these two, especially for, for Caitlin's initial idea on driving this entire thing into existence. I've been getting a lot of compliments this week about, oh, wow, these lights, this whole thing's amazing. And I just say, no, no, it was Caitlin, you know, and tomorrow we're going to be at Immerse Connect going, no, no, that was, that was Nat, you know what I mean? So I uh, just wanted to say on behalf of LMG, and I think I can more broadly say on behalf of Perth <laughs> and the WA game scene, um, thank you both tremendously for everything you've done. So yeah. <laughs> thank you guys. And then on Saturday we're going to do the same to you guys. Yeah, no, that's that's you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys. I don't know what to do now. I'm so yeah. awkward. <laughs> That's it. Bye, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> games, games, games. <laughs> <laughs>